Over the last decade, technology has enabled man to dive to previously unimaginable depths and see with his own eyes the strange world of the deep oceans. As we leave behind the reassuring shapes of the familiar shoals of fish that can be found in the shallows, the creatures that we begin to glimpse in the depths seem far stranger than science fiction, shaped by the terrifyingly extreme conditions of their world. These creatures of the abyss inhabit a dark world devoid of natural light enduring pressures of incredible magnitude. This is a realm so different to ours that it is hard to imagine that we are even on the same planet. Man has always been fascinated by the oceans and the creatures which inhabit their depths. Yet until recently, the deepest parts were a mystery. We knew more about the solar system than we did about the vast, restless mass of water that makes up three quarters of the Earth's surface. Yet recent technological and scientific advances mean that we are poised on the brink of a revolution in oceanography. We're beginning to take these very, very hesitant steps, but it is still uh, something that is so strange and so inaccessible that it remains, as of now at any rate, the, certainly the last frontier of exploration on this planet. And yet the fascinating thing about that is the deepest part of the ocean is only seven miles from the surface. We've been looking at stars and planets for thousands of years, thousands of years. And we've only been looking at the bottom of the ocean for a few decades. And so it's much easier to imagine what's going on in the stars and to look at them. And it's easier to get data from the surface of the moon than it is from the seafloor. We know surprisingly little about the great volume of the ocean that makes up the largest living space on, on Earth. We know the areas that we can gain access to easily. The rest of it is, is virtually unknown. Monterey Bay, California. A few miles from this rugged coastline lies a massive submarine canyon which plunges down to over two miles in depth. Here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, scientists enjoy a unique access to the deep ocean which lies right on their doorstep. Those of us who were interested in the animals that lived deep in the oceanic water column found ourselves in a position where we were trying to describe a habitat and an ecological community that we'd never seen with our own eyes. The important thing for us who wanted to expand our knowledge was to be able to gain direct access, to be able to see at first with our own eyes and ultimately with, uh, with robotic tools what that habitat was like firsthand. We needed to remove the scientists from the deck of the ship at the surface because there we were just groping blindly. It's the largest animal communities on the planet. In order for us to understand them, we had to get there ourselves. The most important research tool on board the ship is the Ventana, a tethered robotic submarine known as an ROV, or Remotely Operated Vehicle. Built to withstand the immense pressures a mile beneath the ship, it carries an impressive array of cameras and lights and sends live pictures back up to Robeson and his team. 
The vast percentage of life in the oceans lives in the first 200 meters. This shallow sunlit realm is rich in life, but the further we descend into the deep, the less life there is. One mile down, and we reach the mid-levels. Here, the pressure is equivalent to one ton per square inch, and life is much more scarce. Deeper still, and the sunlight completely disappears. We now enter the eternal darkness of the abyssal zone, a vast region that makes up four-fifths of the sea floor. Even here, life flourishes. Over the last uh, eight years, I suspect we've, we've come across uh, 100, 150 undescribed species. Um, and the deeper we go, the greater the frequency that we encounter previously undescribed forms. It's really extraordinary how many, uh, how many new kinds of critters there are out there that, were, that we were previously unaware of. Early sailors believed the deep to be the lair of monsters. The Bible tells us of Rahab and the Leviathan, and most famously of all, the story of Jonah, who was swallowed by a whale. Yet it wasn't until the 17th century that sea monsters really caught hold of the popular imagination. If you went out to sea, as the early Portuguese and Spanish explorers did in the uh, 15th century, when they began to look for a way around Africa or look to get across the Atlantic Ocean, um, they saw a lot of strange things that they were unfamiliar with. And then they came back. They came back, if they came back, to their uh, port of origin. And they tried to describe what they had seen. And there are a great many uh, illustrations of strange and wonderful monsters whales with spikes sticking out of their heads and collars of teeth and gigantic octopuses grabbing ships and sinking them. So there were a lot of early exposure to monsters, but many of the creatures that were drawn in these days turned out to be real animals. Probably the best example of this is the giant squid, once known as the kraken, the quintessential monster of the deep. The largest known specimen yet discovered measured over 60 feet from the tip of its tentacles to the end of its body. An animal of this size weighs approximately a ton and has eight arms, three hearts, and a tongue which is lined with teeth. Another popular monster of the deep was the giant sea serpent, yet this too had its origins in fact, a mysterious animal known as the oar fish. Sightings are extremely rare, and this video of an oarfish that had come to the surface off the coast of California is the only time the creature has been filmed alive. First sighted, washed up on a beach in Bermuda in 1860, the fish grows to a length of 30 feet. Unlike the fearsome sea serpent, the oarfish is toothless and quite harmless. An oarfish is a fish with a large red coxcomb of a crest, and it is, in fact, the longest fish in the ocean. They are probably deep water fishes, like so many creatures of the depths, we know very little about them. Um, things come to the surface for reasons known only to those things that come to the surface. They may be sick, they may be damaged, uh, but they are certainly fascinating to look at. As you see this, this silvery ribbon of a fish, it's not difficult to imagine how sea serpent stories could have grown from a fish that looks like this. In the control room of his research vessel, Bruce Robeson finds the creatures that he studies far more interesting than any mythological sea monsters. If you look at mythological creatures or, or reach back and, and read about the kinds of things that, that people imagine might live in the deep sea, um, they are rather narrowly portrayed. 
what's striking about the things that we're finding and learning is that the reality is, is much more diverse. Many of the animals that we encounter are beautiful, almost beyond description, because they're so different from everything that we're accustomed to. We have trouble finding the words to describe the kinds of textures and, and movements and, and colors that we see in, in these creatures. The only way you're going to be disappointed is if, uh, if you're looking for a 12-headed monster with, uh, with big fangs that uh, is going to, going to eat your ship. Roberson is one of the scientists at the cutting edge of oceanography, a science hardly a century old, which has its origins in a voyage made from England. London's Natural History Museum is home to one of the world's oldest and largest collections of marine specimens, preserved in formalin since the last century. It's called the Challenger Collection, after the ship that found them. The 1800s were an extraordinary age of discovery and exploration. In 1859, Darwin had set the scientific world alight with his theory of evolution. Ten years later, in 1870, the public was captivated by Jules Verne's book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But despite all this, the world still believed that nothing could live in the deep oceans. It was HMS Challenger's mission to find out if this was true. She set sail in 1872 on a journey that would change our understanding forever. The Challenger expedition had a number of objectives, and the principal one was to investigate life in the deep sea. The background was the azoic theory that nothing lived there, and although there'd been glimmerings of indications that this was, wasn't so in the late 1860s, the Challenger was going to go all around the world, was to dredge at all depths and see what the truly global situation was. What she found was, wherever you dredged, Wherever you were in the world ocean, you could pick up a wide variety of living organisms. Life simply existed everywhere. It brought back and discovered thousands of species of animals ranging from fishes all the way down to protozoans that had never been described before. These were new species, so there were lots of those discoveries. It discovered uh, that the bottom of the ocean was very, very cold and even colder than the suspected temperature of four degrees, which everybody thought it was, as low as two degrees, even less in some places. The thing about the Challenger was it went all over the world. It collected the largest body of data that had, at that time, ever been assembled, and I suspect since been assembled by one cruise. And all this, this data and these collections were brought back to the UK to establish oceanography as a new science. As the oceans slowly revealed their secrets, scientists became more and more intrigued by what really lay in the watery depths. Working from the deck of a boat was one thing, but what any self-respecting naturalist craved was to see the creatures of the deep in their natural environment. That privilege fell to William Beebe, an explorer and naturalist from the Bronx Zoo in New York, who turned his attention from beasts of the air to creatures in the deep. In 1934, he became the first person to descend to a depth of half a mile in his bathysphere and make direct observations of the life which could be found there. It was an enormously primitive sort of a deal. They just locked themselves in this, this steel ball that had very thick and very small windows. It had some oxygen-producing devices, and they had palm frond fans to keep the air moving. And eventually, they would run out of air, and they'd crank them back up again. They couldn't move. They were like some big yo-yo that you just drop down there, and they sat there. And they looked out the windows. Um, and whatever swam by, they identified. It was for its time, the deepest descent ever made, and BB achieved enormous notoriety and popularity for being the deep sea explorer. No pioneer, 
peering at a Martian landscape could ever have a greater thrill at such an opportunity. At times, there were flashes from unknown organisms so bright that my vision was confused for several seconds. Often, the abundance of light was so great that the comparison was unavoidable with the major stars on a clear, moonlit night. Amid nameless sparks, unexplained luminous explosions, abortive glimpses of strange organisms, there came adequate opportunity to add a definite new fish or other creature to our knowledge of the life of the deep sea. The sad part of the story is that the things that he saw seemed so outrageous to the rest of the scientific community at the time that many of his discoveries were discounted and he was not nearly as highly regarded as, uh, as he is today, as a pioneer of this in situ or uh, direct access approach to, to studying the deep sea. The more we dive now, the more time we spend in, in midwater, the more we realize that the kinds of things that, that Beebe described uh, were correct. It is only now that Beebe's observations have been accepted as the truth. The pictures that are being brought back by the latest generation of ROVs are proving just as strange as the creatures he described in his diaries. On board the Point Lobos, the crew prepare for the launch of the ROV into the canyon miles beneath them. Using the Ventana has been likened to lowering a torch into the Grand Canyon at night. It can only see a fraction of the water around it, so much of the life in the ocean can easily avoid detection. Nevertheless, they are bringing back spectacular pictures of unusual marine life from the depths. The Monterey Submarine Canyon is a huge cleft in the continental shelf that uh, ranges from a depth of just a, a few feet at the harbor entrance to a depth of 3,800 meters, about 60 miles offshore. It has rugged walls and side canyons and is very much like the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River in, in Arizona, only this one's filled with water. Robeson and his team concentrate their research on an area known as the Midwater Column, which begins where the shallow waters end and descends to a depth of 6,000 feet. Though it is inky black to the human eye, this is the area with the most abundant and diverse deep water life. Gelatinous invertebrates like this Narcomedusa or vertebrates like this Gulper eel. The adaptations that have allowed animals to penetrate into and to succeed in, in the deep sea mean that they are adapted to high pressures, low temperatures, uh, a variety of, of different conditions. We're learning uh, a great deal about uh, the uh, biochemical mechanisms, the physiological means by which these animals are able to adapt to those, those harsh conditions. This extremely rare vampire squid is unique in that it forms the only living link between squid and octopus. As it spreads its arms out, the impression is of a cloak being drawn around it, this being how it gets its name. Perhaps the most difficult of the conditions that it has to adapt to is that of pressure. The density of water around this creature is roughly equivalent to one ton bearing down on each square inch of its body. Although such forces would squash a human to pulp, the animals here are perfectly adapted to their environment. For the most part, they lack gas volumes inside their bodies that would cause trouble when they change depth. For animals that have body tissues that are 99.9% .9 water, um, pressure poses no particular threat because the pressure inside their bodies is balanced by what's outside their bodies. And with no uh, large difference in pressure, 
and pressure between the internal and external environment. There's no real threat to the, to the structure and stability of the, of the animal. However, at greater depths, animals like this hatchet fish have their very body chemistry affected by the forces at work. As we go deeper, beyond uh, 1,000 or even 2,000 meters, pressure begins to have a different sort of effect in that enzymes and, and uh, proteins uh, can become distorted so that the animals that live successfully in deep water have adapted to that situation by developing molecular structures for key enzymes in their bodies that allow those enzymes to, to function at greater depth. If those animals are moved into shallower water where the pressure is reduced, then the shape of the enzyme changes and they, and they function far less efficiently. With nearly 600 meters of cable paid out, the ROV has reached its target depth. Their mission today is to find and collect a creature known as the Nanomia. It's a fuzzy, string-like, gelatinous creature with an intricate array of tentacles, which it deploys for drawing in its prey. The Nanomia's body is a hollow stem through which digesting food passes. It has several stomachs attached to the main trunk. They feed on tiny shrimp-like crustaceans called krill. Today we're collecting specimens of Nanomia, a distant relative of the Portuguese man-of-war, only one that lives considerably deeper in the ocean. It's a predator, quite, a, uh, quite an accomplished and, and successful predator here in Monterey Bay. But uh, because it's soft-bodied and, and gelatinous, I guess it doesn't get the credit for being a, a carnivore that, uh, that it deserves. We'll be collecting specimens to take back to the laboratory to do digestion rate studies. We've uh, been able to keep them alive in the laboratory, alive and well for uh, considerable periods of time. We can feed them measure the time that it takes to uh, digest their prey. And uh, with a number of individuals feeding on a number of different prey items, we get a relatively good idea of uh, what the digestion rate and digestion efficiency is. Using the joystick to maneuver the vehicle far below, the Ventana is guided into position to collect a small sample of Nanomia in one of the jars attached to the ROV. When the animal has been carefully positioned, the press of a button slides the bottom of the jar shut and the creature is trapped, ready to be transported to the surface. For more agile creatures, the Ventana uses a different method of capture, a device like an underwater hoover, which simply sucks the unsuspecting animal into a sample jar. Once the ROV has emerged from the ocean, it's hoisted back on board the boat, and the sample jars full of specimens are taken into the shipboard labs and prepared for transportation back to the Institute. Unlike the days of the Challenger, where every sample was immediately pickled in large glass jars, nowadays, increasingly successful attempts are being made to keep the creatures alive for further study. Fine art of Nanomia Corral. We've had some striking successes with animals that we've brought back to the surface and maintained in the laboratory. We've also had some dismal failures. We can try to replicate in the laboratory most of the conditions that, uh, that occur in deep water. Low temperature, uh, low oxygen concentrations, low light, those are all relatively easy to deal with. Pressure is a, is a very big challenge, and uh, that's one that we've begun to work on, but, but so far are, we're treading very carefully as we, as we move in that direction. Here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Scientists are hard at work trying to solve the problems of keeping midwater animals alive and well. 
they hope to open a new deep ocean exhibit by the year 2000. The animals live in a completely limitless three-dimensional realm. So we're having to develop new types of aquaria, which will allow the animals to swim without encountering any solid surfaces. And this has involved some creative geometry and, and thinking about things in a different way to see if we can develop that sort of an aquarium. We have to chill down all the water, which is very different from the tropical aquariums where you have to keep it warm. Um, we have to be very careful about how much light we use on specimens of animals that are visual, because some of these animals are very sensitive to bright light. For pressure, we are working with prototyping high-pressure aquariums, but those present a whole other set of problems that we're trying to avoid. Most of the animals we work with do not appear to require the very high, full-depth pressures that we find in the deep oceans. Of all the adaptations these animals have made to mid-water conditions, bioluminescence is perhaps the most fascinating. Creatures like this tenophore have evolved an ability to emit their own light. Bioluminescence is the result of a chemical reaction between two enzymes in the animal's body. The range of uses to which the animals put it is quite staggering. One of the puzzles that we're constantly trying to unravel is how do animals use bioluminescence? And we're trying to answer the, the question by making direct observations of their behavior. It's pretty clear that there are a number of different applications that bioluminescence can be put to in the, in the deep sea. It's, uh, it's certain that some animals protect themselves from predators. Using bioluminescence to hide from predators is an ability exhibited by this Galatuthis squid, which Robeson catches sight of and determines to catch. Look at the way he's moving those eyes independently. Light is generated by bioluminescent organs called photophores, which are situated in the lower part of the squid's eyes. The glow emitted by these organs helps to erase any shadows produced by the dense structure of the eye itself, the only part of this gelatinous animal that is not transparent. Scientists are still uncovering a bewildering variety of uses for bioluminescence. As well as camouflage, it can be used for both hunting and mating. This dragonfish attracts its prey into striking distance with a small bioluminescent lure suspended beneath its jaw. These gelatinous baroi use distinctive patterns of light to help attract mates. As well as light, sound has an important role to play in the deep but not all the sounds that are heard by biologists can be identified. Several years ago when I was diving, I got permission from the topside supervisor to shut down the entire sub except for the power going to a small hydrophone. And I sat there listening as, as hard as I could to try to see what in, in the form of recognizable sounds were out there around me. I heard a, an enormous range of different kinds of sounds, very few of which I could identify. There are a great many oral signals that uh, we, we can't put together yet with, with any known activity or any known creatures. During the Cold War, the US Navy developed an extraordinary array of undersea microphones that could listen to and track enemy submarines all over the world. Called SOSUS and built at a cost of $16 billion, it's now being used to listen to the extraordinary sounds of the deep. Chris Fox is a geophysicist who specializes in analyzing the data provided by the SOSUS system. These listening devices can pick up sounds from distances of thousands of miles, and there are a whole array of mysterious noises that have yet to be identified. This is the sound that we, yeah, that we first noticed when we were um, 
when we first turned on in 1991, it emanates from the, the um, basically the middle of nowhere, the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. And uh, it's fairly mysterious sounding, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is coming from sort of midway between Chile and uh, New Zealand and we're able to listen to it right here off the coast of Oregon. So, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Sounds a bit like bubbles, perhaps. I don't know. As well as the many mysterious sounds of the deep, they are able to listen to familiar marine life and underwater geological activity. What you're looking at here now is a blow up of the fin whale calls that we saw on the spectrograms over there. <laughs> You're hearing a mixture of a low-frequency call and high-frequency calls. Finally, why don't we listen to one earthquake? A bit like rolling thunder, I think. That, that would be a typical uh, earthquake in the ocean. We've been hearing them since 1991. Uh, the whales have obviously been hearing them for millions of years, and um, uh, until we had access to SOSIS, this is the sort of information that we didn't have available. However, as well as the extraordinary geological activity, scientists were amazed to discover that the seabed was alive in a way no one had ever thought possible. Here at the Southampton Oceanography Center, deep sea biologists like Paul Tyler are busy studying the bizarre creatures which, despite the pitch blackness of the water, the freezing cold and the crushing pressure, have adapted to life in the depths of the sea. Tyler recently visited the Gulf of Mexico in a manned submersible, where he captured a prized specimen on the sea floor. This is a giant isopod. And we found this in the Gulf of Mexico uh, at about 600 meters depth. And it's very closely related to the isopods, or the wood lice as we call them, um, that are found behind one's sofa and in the hidden parts of one's home. Where they tend to be about a centimeter long, um, as you can see, this fellow is 32 centimeters or just over one foot long. Really quite a magnificent animal. It's a classic scavenger. Um, anything that dies eventually will sink to the deep sea floor. It can be fish, it can be um, other animals, it can be even bits of whale and dolphins and things like that. Um, and much as the hyenas of the plains of East Africa, which, for which we're all familiar, will go around scavenging uh, dead meat, this animal does exactly the same. Um, it'll go round and it'll use this incredible apparatus here um, and it just tears off lumps of meat um, and will just sort of swallow them whole. If we turn it over, we can see it's almost like body armour and you can see how the, the bits articulate together. And when we collected this, we used a special suction hose which it curled up into a ball like so, just as a woodlouse does, and then the suction hose just caught it and just carried it up off the bottom and then dropped it into our collecting basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just Dropping wonderful. It. Using a time-lapse camera dropped to the seabed miles below, scientists can record images of life at the bottom of the sea. Found at an average depth of two miles, the abyssal plain makes up over 90% of the ocean floor. Long thought by scientists to be a vast, unchanging desert, recent discoveries have revealed a far more complex ecosystem than was previously imagined. The seabed has long been covered by a thick layer of sediment, home to billions of creatures that dwell deep within it, hidden from view. 
It looks very strange to the human eye because when you look at the deep sea, all you see is mud, featureless mud that goes on forever. Now, of course, if you wander into a rainforest, you can see life all around you. Everywhere you look, there's a different species of tree, and you see birds, monkeys, insects. And the reason is, is that the rainforest is at the same scale as a human being. But if you were to travel in a balloon a couple of thousand feet above a rainforest, what would you see? You'd see green squidgy stuff everywhere as far as the eye could see. You wouldn't see any of this life. Now, when we travel in submersibles above the mud in the deep sea, what we're looking at is the surface of their environment. We have to get down into that mud, down into that environment that the animals live in, and then it's like descending into a rainforest. Suddenly the life springs out at you. This is one of the German cores that's taken off the polar stern, which is a German research vessel, and this one's come from the South Atlantic. And this is part of the study we're carrying out from the Antarctic right through to the Arctic, and we're trying to map the background biodiversity. We've got to get the animals out of this muddy sediment. Not sure how many we'll find in here, maybe a couple of thousand, I would think. Biologists have always used sieves. Um, ever since the 19th century, you've got the problem of separating the animals from the mud and sand. So what we basically do is um, we get the animals up into the water column and then we pour the water through this sieve like this. Now the problem is when we first started working in the deep sea, we naturally used what we were familiar with, the sieves from shallow water. And the plain fact is the mesh was too wide. Gradually, we've made the sieves smaller and smaller and smaller. And every time we make the sieves smaller, we find more life. And it always fascinates me to think that the finding of deep sea biodiversity, to some extent, depended on just using a smaller mesh. The dominant creature to be found in this cold, murky, highly pressurized environment are the nematodes, microscopic worms, which are the most successful and abundant life form on the planet. There are literally millions of different species of nematode living among the sediment of the abyssal plain. Some feed on bacteria, some on the sediment itself, and some survive as predators, using, relatively speaking, huge jaws and teeth. There is plenty of life to be found above the sediment, however, from strange creatures like this giant sea crab to the soft and slimy sea cucumbers which crawl across the vast abyssal plains. These are, belong to the dominant group of animals that inhabit the, the really deep sea floor. They're called holothurians or sea cucumbers because they look like sea, sea cu cucumbers, basically. They're relatives of uh, the uh, starfishes and the um, sea urchins that you're familiar with in shallow water. And they come in a variety of forms, basically variations on a theme. This is a sort of typical one. As you can see, it uh, looks a bit like a cucumber, though uh, um, I wouldn't eat it, but some Japanese people do. And like all the other uh, holothurians or sea cucumbers, this thing wanders across the, the seabed, hoovering up the sediment and taking out the goodness that's uh, in amongst the, the particles to uh, give it fuel to lift. Here, this is another one called Cycropotes longicorda, which simply means the long-tailed Cycropotes. And as you can see, it's in two bits. And this is the, the body part of this beast, with a sort of sole here with little feet and its mouth at that end. It sits like that on the bottom, with this tail, which is inflated in uh, life, sticking up into the water column, and again, crawls slowly across the bottom, hoovering up the sediment. And finally, dear old Anirophanta. Now, this is, is a, also a, a sea cucumber, a slightly different group. And as you can see, this has got long, long tentacles and protuberances all over the place. It also uh, sits on the bottom and walks across on long tube feet, and they seem to move across a bit like bison do across the great plains of America in what are called herds. There are millions and millions of these animals on the seafloor. This one, for example, is widely distributed all over the deep Atlantic at about three or four, maybe uh, per thousand square meters. But since there are billions of square meters of suitable uh, habitat on the bottom of the Atlantic, you can imagine there are large numbers of these. In fact, some of these animals, although they are relatively rare in museum collections, are amongst the most abundant on Earth and far more abundant than human beings. Tony Rice is responsible for one of the more surprising discoveries of recent years, that the deep oceans have seasons. 20 years ago, all deep-sea biologists 
um, and oceanographers generally, thought that the deep sea floor, the abyss, was a totally monotonous, non-seasonal environment. It was thought that the supply of organic matter, food, which arrived at the bottom in the form of tiny particles sinking very slowly, would have long since lost any uh, seasonal signal that they received at the surface. But now we know that that's not true, that many parts of the abyss receive a very strong seasonal signal which reflects seasonality in the uh, shallow waters over the top of them. And the culprits are these, because these are cultures of unicellular algae which form the community of phytoplankton, which occurs in the sunlit upper layers throughout the oceans, and it's that source of food locking up sunlight in energy, photosynthesis, exactly the same process that occurs on land, which the whole of the deep sea, with the exception of the hydrothermal vents, is totally dependent upon. Now, how does that material get to the bottom of the oceans? For 80 years, it was thought only in these tiny, slow, sinking particles. Now we know, we don't know the mechanism exactly, but we know that under some circumstances, these little boys clump together into large lumps which sink like a stone. It became known in the trade as fluff, or more correctly, as phytodetritus. And that's been the key to an understanding of many of the things which were puzzling people for many years before that, like why, if the abyss was so monotonous, why were quite a number of deep sea animals seasonal breeders? The main users of the phytodetritus are the little tiny jobs that you wouldn't see by your naked eye. These are the animals living on and within the mud between the particles. And these hoover up this stuff. I mean, this is manna from, from heaven for, the, for them. And when phytodetritus arrives, they go crazy. Not only are there seasons in the deep, but weather of sorts as well. Deep sea or benthic storms are a regular occurrence on the abyssal plain. Suddenly, the current speed will increase from a few centimeters a second to many tens of centimeters a second. And so this great wind of water will rush across the bottom. And of course, with this very soft flocculent mud, up it comes in great clouds and is transported, sometimes many kilometers, before the wind, the current, stops and the material settles back to the bottom. The animals that live there have to be able to cope with this, and cope with this they can. The endless stretches of the abyssal plain are not the only areas of the ocean floor being investigated. In 1977, scientists investigating volcanoes deep under the Pacific Ocean near the Galapagos Islands made a remarkable discovery hydrothermal vents. Hot, mineral-rich water reaching temperatures of more than 300 degrees centigrade gushes up from cracks in the seabed, providing a home for huge colonies of extraordinary animals. As the hot water shoots up, it deposits sulfur and other minerals on the sides of the vents. This builds chimneys which can stretch up to 30 feet tall. The hot sulfur also colors the water black, earning the vents the nickname black smokers. The most extraordinary thing about the fauna here is that it doesn't rely in some way on photosynthesis. Instead, bacteria convert sulfur from the vents into energy, a process known as chemosynthesis. The bacteria are the starting point of a food chain, which includes such creatures as these tube worms, or fish like this eel pout. Instead of solar power, the food chain is derived from geothermal power, animals flourishing in a sulfide-rich environment, which would be toxic to most other forms of life. Paul Tyler recently visited similar vents in the Atlantic. As you look out of the porthole, there's, as you're coming up towards the main vent itself, you see a variety of animals. There's things like snails, and particularly on the rocks, there's these wonderful sea anemones. But as you move towards the main edifice itself, you see crabs, and then more and more shrimp come in. Then you move up to the main vent itself, 
and suddenly there's just billions and billions of shrimp. That is no exaggeration. And you move towards the main vent and you can then start seeing the black smoke coming out at the top of the vent and then going up towards the vent are these just a complete layer of shrimp going you know, right the way as far as the eye can see. And all around you, you the sub just touches the seabed and they all sort of blow up like dust. Um, and then they settle back down because they have to get back to the seabed to get their energy. The environment in hydrothermal vents would appear to us to be very toxic. Anything that's spewing out hot water at 350 degrees Celsius plus and with vast amounts of hydrogen sulfide, if we tried to get anywhere near it, we would die immediately. And so would most marine animals. And the spectacular thing about the animals living at hydrothermal vents is they've learned to live at both high temperatures and at high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. The hydrothermal fluid drives the whole system. It builds the chimneys as the chemicals are precipitated from it. It provides the energy for the animals to live around the, the, the chimneys or around the hydrothermal vents. And when it's cut off, for any reason whatsoever, that hydrothermal vent will die. The research vessel Thompson is investigating volcanic activity on the sea floor. The most important recent biological discovery associated with undersea volcanic sites are the mysterious clouds of bacterial flock, or more descriptively, SLIME, an acronym for Subsurface Chemolitho-Autotropic Microbial Ecosystems, life forms that seem to live within the volcanoes themselves. First seen in 1993, slime is basically a cloud of primitive life forms which have coagulated together into snow-like clumps. Warm seawater was coming out continuously and has con come out continuously for the last three years. And accompanying this warm seawater that comes out of the cracks in the seafloor are, are bacterial flock that look like little pieces of tissue paper floating in the, in the seawater. And it comes out in such abundance it looks like a snowstorm. Current work suggests that bacterial flock may well be the descendant of the first life forms to have evolved on the planet 3,800 million years ago. Deposits of flock are thought to exist in the deep biosphere far beneath the seabed. They are released when the ocean floor cracks during volcanic activity. The fact that water is circulating in the rocks makes it almost certain that there's tremendous amounts of life circulating, living within the cracks of the rocks. We haven't proven that, that's a hypothesis, but the fact that we observe uh, biological flock coming out of, with the warm water during the eruption and after the eruption cycle argues strongly that there's a large amount of microbial activity that lives within the rocks itself. That's a very exciting hypothesis. Scientists believe that there is a far greater significance to hydrothermal vents than was at first thought. The space probe Galileo, in orbit around Jupiter, recently sent back startling pictures of a large moon called Europa. The picture showed an icy, fractured surface, scarred with the evidence of the recent volcanic activity 30 miles beneath it. Scientists suspect that Europa has a deep inner sea, kept liquid by the volcanic heat at the moon's core raising hopes that some form of extraterrestrial life could well have evolved around vent sites similar to those on Earth. However, the final frontier and its secrets are not to be found in space, but here in the deep oceans of planet Earth. We are just beginning to understand how our own planet works, and as recent discoveries in the deep are showing, some of the solutions to the problems we face are being found in the oceans. The final programme is next Monday at 8 o'clock. Well, next on 4, a mystery that could completely rewrite human history. In a new three-part series, writer Graham Hancock is on a quest for the lost civilization.
Think Back 65